the reason I wrote um, Though the Heavens May Fall uh, was to show how any thing, any legal thing, could use the judicial system to be able to show that he wasn't a legal thing. That if you, go, if you have the right judge, who's a principal judge, you know, you make the right kind of arguments, you have the right time, the right politics, then, then through the judicial process, you can do, do amazing things. And one of the things that you can do is that you can change the thinghood of a being to personhood. And indeed, um, I start, though the heavens may fall, with the 200th anniversary bicentennial dinner of the um, Somerset decision. And the Lord Mayor of London stands up and says, you know, in the United States, in order to end slavery, you had to have a bloody civil war in which 600,000 people were killed. And in the UK, we did it by a judicial decision. And indeed, it can be done. It can be done by a judicial decision. If you, if every, you know, if the stars are aligned properly, you can do it. And so, the job of people like me is to uh, understand when the stars are aligned properly, to try to encourage other people to get those stars aligned properly, and then uh, at, at the right time to to move. The Somerset case in, in, involved um, a man named J James Somerset who was kidnapped from Africa at about the age of eight, and and he was brought um, to Virginia. There he was purchased. Um, uh, by a man, J James Stewart, and he became James Stewart, uh, S James Stewart's slave for the next 25 years. Stewart um, uh, became uh, the highest British customs official in North America, and uh, he would he would travel from Boston to Virginia and bring James Somerset with him. And Somerset became really his trust, very trusted servant. He lived in Boston for a while, and. Uh, uh, Charles Stewart eventually got very tired and, and sick and, and, and asked for permission to come to England, and, and he did. So I think in 1769 he brought, um, he brought um, James Somerset from Boston to London, and there they recapitulated it. Uh, uh, Somerset again was Stewart's um, you know, right-hand man. He would travel alone without him, but he also, you know, perhaps he lived in Boston during a very um, you know, a formative time there. He must have seen John Adams and John Hancock and Samuel Adams, or, or he were, something happened when he got to London. But one of, the, one of the things he did was he got himself baptized in 1771. Now he might have gotten himself baptized because he wanted to be a Christian. He might have gotten himself baptized because it was believed very strongly in, against all evidence that uh, that one Christian could not enslave another, so that if you were baptized, whether you actually believed or not, you couldn't be enslaved. So he got baptized and he also picked up three godparents. And sometimes when slaves got baptized and had godparents, the, it, it was understood that the function of the godparents would be to help him escape from slavery. So uh, sometime in 1771, um, he did escape. And something happened between him and Charles Stewart that infuriated Charles Stewart. He talked about his person being insulted. I, we don't know exactly what that meant. But James Somerset then disappeared into, into just a teeming London, the largest city in the world that just teemed. And uh, what Charles Stewart did is to put slave catchers on James Somerset. And it took almost two months before they were able to run James Somerset down find him, and instead of bringing him back to Charles Stewart, they put him in irons on a ship, the Anna Mary, that was going to sail for Jamaica, where he was to be sold in the slave markets, and Charles Stewart understood full well that he would then uh, have to work in the, sh in the sugarcane fields and that his life would probably go on for about five years before he just died of sheer exhaustion. So what happened is that somebody, we don't know exactly who, went to L Lord Mansfield, who was the um, Chief Justice of the Court of King's Bench in London, and saw a writ of habeas corpus, you know, produced the body, saying, you can't do this to James Somerset. And before the Anna Mary could sail, uh, Lord Mansfield had um, James Somerset brought to him, issued the writ of habeas corpus, he produced the body, and then set up a, a series of trial dates for, to, for them to decide whether, whether, um, ch whether Charles Stewart uh, had the right to sell him or whether James Somerset had the right not to be sold. 
and in, a, in probably you know one of the most famous trials um, uh, that lasted on and off for seven months, which was extraordinary. I mean, it was quite extraordinary. You, you have to realize that at, the, at that time, the average felony criminal trial lasted eight minutes, including jury deliberation. So it, to, to, to have a trial go on and off for seven months was extraordinary. Plus, uh, there were almost no lawyers involved. The lawyers were not really involved in the legal system in 1772. And it would be very rare to have even one lawyer appear. To have two lawyers appear was quite quite rare. And here, you actually had seven lawyers involved. James Somerset had five and Charles Stewart had two. And these were the most famous, um, wealthy, civil liberties types, every, everyone you can think of, lawyers of that time. And L Lord Mansfield um, did not really want to make a decision. Uh, he was... Um, you know, he was of a social class where almost probably everyone he knew had slaves. Uh, he had a slave, and but it was even more complex than that because his slave was his um, his grandniece, and he and he actually uh, lived with two grandnieces. One of them was a mulatto, uh, Dido, and the other was was um, was white. And but he raised them very similarly. They were they were almost the same age, and uh, by all, by. All accounts, he he loved them both very very much, but she was also his slave. You know, one of them was Dido. Was all, Dido Bell was also his slave, so he he also understood uh, that um, slavery was was very important to the British economy, and and he was v acutely aware of economic things. Uh, so it seemed that he wasn't the best judge to bring this case in front of. But on the other hand, he may have been. You know, the greatest, the fairest judge to ever speak English. He was, no matter what his own personal and political opinions were, he, he was very, very concerned about doing justice to the litigants in, before him. So maybe he was the judge to bring this kind of a case in front of. It, it was clearly a crapshoot. And uh, these seven lawyers made you know, every argument they could think of. Pre precedent, you know, policy, principle, uh, and, it, and it went on, and it, and it was fought out in letters to the editor, which was quite unusual at, at the time. And at, at one point in May of 1772, Lord Mansfield would just really, really wanted to get the parties to settle. He just he didn't want to make the decision, and he really wanted um, someone to buy James Somerset or for uh, for Charles Stewart to agree to release him as a slave or something. But by that time, everyone had seen this as the test case on whether, whether slavery was legal in England. And uh, after a series of arguments in, in, in May, where, which included refusals to settle the case, Lord Mansfield finally said, well then, let justice be done, though the heavens may fall, which is why I named my book, Though the Heavens May Fall. And then a month later, he issued his opinion uh, that, that said that, that uh, slavery was so odious that the common law would not support it. So he was a principal judge and, and he ordered James Somerset uh, freed. And, and by implication, he was ordering all 15,000 slaves in England freed. And uh, um, it, it's not sure how much he came to regret this. And 13 years later in, in a case he was, saying, he was saying, well, I'm not sure if I really meant all this, but, uh, but that case had gone way past his control. Whatever he meant, people could read. Although, interestingly enough, you know, there weren't court reporters at the time either. Uh, so we had eight different versions as to what Lord Mansfield actually said in court. He never made a written decision. He spoke it from the bench. We had eight different versions as, as to what he said, some of them dramatically different from each other. But seven of, seven of the versions, I think, or, or most of them agree that he did say that, that the common law was so odious that uh, it would not support slavery. And that spread like wildfire all over the British Empire, throughout England and into the Americas. And uh, uh, that really was the beginning of the end of slavery, human slavery, and I hope non-human slavery.